Hey everybody, Paul Preston from the Movie Guys back here at the Pasadena International Film Festival. Are you? I still haven't met anybody from another country. You're not that guy, are you? No. Uh, I mean, I'm trying to do the inter make the international thing work out, but I uh, haven't yet. I can give you another state. I'm from Texas originally. So. Oh, okay, but you live here now? Yeah. All right. Well, not here in Burbank. Boring Burbank. Hey, I live in Burbank, the land of no parking meters. Yeah. The small yeah. town in the big city. I love yeah. it. Yeah, Glendale, you have to pay for parking, but in, in Burbank, Suckers. you can find pockets of non-paying. The garages are free, too. That's really the best reason. Well, for it. a while. Or after six. Uh, yeah, that's right. Uh, so, you are not p- uh, participating in a film. Uh, not as not far this as, year, no. No, but last year, you brought a script to the festival, yeah? Yeah, well, basically what I do is scripts. I, uh, I did a web series for a while, and I've done little shorts of my own, which I write, produce, direct on, let's, shall we say, a shoestring budget. So much of a shoestring that really it's a boot. So I do that, and then I also do more involved scripts. This was a short I sent in, and the way this festival works is they, they, they don't discriminate. They put 30 screenplays in a pile where it's full-length pilots and short scripts, regardless of this. If it's a good script, boom, it's in there. Wow. I think I was in there with, I want to say, 11 other shorts, and there were about almost an equal number of pilots, and then about maybe six, seven, eight full-length scripts. So really the full-length scripts, I don't think... We're as fairly represented as the others, really, but we all, we're all we all in there together. And then when the gala happened, we didn't know who was going to win. I kind of thought the full-length script was going to win, uh, one of the full-length scripts, because if I have 120 pages to tell a story and not 15 like my, mine was, I figure I have a better shot at, you know, getting people involved in it if I have more story to tell. Yeah. So, sure well, enough. Well, you could go astray, though, if you're shooting too high, you know? Well, one of the full-lengths did win, so yeah. I was right about that. But at that point, then I figured any pilot, any short film to get nominated for your script was probably a big thing because you've managed to pull them in and involve them enough to get it nominated in a short, a very short amount of time. Like I say, my script was 16 pages long. Right now, that script, Honor, uh, it's called Honor, and that thing uh, has been here and there. It won this honorable mention at some place here in the L.A. area, I forget. And I said, honorable mention, is that good? He goes, you're the only script that won an honorable mention. Everything else is a film. I went, okay, thank you. <laughs> kind of got mad at me on the uh, sending me an email. Anyway, so I did that. This particular short, is this was this close to getting somebody to buy it and do it? And then he backed out, and I was like, oh, don't worry. So I'm, I'm hoping hey, to get that one. Hey, that's L.A., man. Yeah. yeah up and down well, and all that. Actually, this, actually, this guy was from Minnesota. He still backed out. <laughs> but because but he wanted to, I, I have a beach scene that in that particular script that goes at the beginning at the end. And he wanted to use the great, because he lives in Minnesota, he wanted to use the Great Lakes area. I said, well, go ahead. As long as it has water and there's a beach, Tons I don't care. Tons of pine trees. <laughs> but I, I think winter came early last year to Minnesota, and he backed out, and so far I haven't heard from him again. So I get the feeling I'm not going to, but you never know. I but Just say in development, right? Yeah. yeah I, well, that to me, <laughs> from what I hear from writers, that is like the nightmare from hell to be in development. Oh, really? That pretty much means oh. your script will see the light of day I thought I was in, a, to, I was in about to, five years. Well, I was trying to save you from completely dead projects. So no, no, just no. say it's in development. Oh, yeah, I could say that. <laughs> I, I could say I'm developing other people to try to give it to them. Uh, <laughs> so I, now you've come back this year. Yeah. What have you seen so far? I've seen a really interesting documentary tonight about people being abducted by UFOs. Oh, the last people I talked to said that was really cool. It was interesting. Now, the problem with any kind of documentary, because you know how documentaries tend to be a little bit redundant, because after, Talking the, heads, right? well, after the interviewee yeah. has said the same thing about 17 different ways, 17 different times, uh, yeah, you are filling up the hour and a half. Yeah. But, you know, after a while, you're like checking your watch. Now, it was a good film, but I think it would have better, been better short than a full length mm. myself. But it did touch on something that very a lot of people talk about, but usually these are the kind of topics you heard about on the Tom Snyder's Old Tomorrow Show back in the day. <laughs> yeah. Something like something weird, something yeah. pe- on the fringe of most people's knowledge and or caring. After you fire up the color <laughs> teenies, right? Right. But <laughs> <clears throat> Snyder had a way of, of making Satanists and whoever came on his show back in the day seem legitimate or seem yeah. illegitimate. But Snyder had that interesting way. I love that man as far as being a journalist yeah. because he kind of started kind of tabloid journalism in a way on TV because he ran basically a tabloid talk show back in the day. Back at one in the morning... Uh, you know, back in the 70s and 80s, he was the first kind of Maury Povich, Jerry Springer hybrid. Yeah, he just came out there with bizarre people talking about really bizarre things. I'll never forget the Satanist who had a little wax doll and he was pretending to uh, do a curse 
And Snyder goes, you're getting a little intense. He goes, hey, practice makes perfect. So he's sticking this dagger in this wax figurine, and Snyder's looking at him like, and I, I always loved, because he was the common man, looking at it the way we'd look at it. Yeah. Like, woo, this guy's out to lunch. So did you think the people in this dock were crazy? No. No. What, what was new about the whole alien abduction angle that we haven't heard? That well, I think seldom do we get such, I want to say, drama in how it's being presented. In the fact that these people are crying on camera, their lives have been ruined, all these things by coming out and saying, uh. I was and there's no real good reason to say, I've been abducted by aliens. There's just no real good attention. reason to do it. Um, but it's clearly but it backfired. It's, it's, not, <laughs> it's not exactly usually good in, yeah. good attention. It's negative attention. Now, I, you know, they all always say there's no such thing as bad press. But in this particular case, I mean, one guy got divorced, another woman lost her family. All, you know, they disowned her saying... What you was know, the name of this film? This film was called... Oh, my goodness. I forgot what it's called. Uh, the last guy said it. Uh, we'll, we'll find it out. Yeah, we'll, we'll, put we'll it get it on the But it's, it's extremely interesting insofar as the, the interview is being very emotional. And I just can't believe these people are lying. They're either totally psychotic. Don't know what the truth is anymore. Or there's something about... I mean, I think uh, somebody's spouse put it best. She asked her spouse, do you believe me? And he goes, I believe that you believe it. Yeah, and right. that's all you can say for these people. I don't know if I believe but I believe they believe it wholeheartedly. And that was a different angle because usually it's very clinical. It's the psychologist talking about it. It's the UFO experts talking about it. But it's hardly for the people who got you know, abducted because that's too far off on the fringe. And these people are sitting there telling these horrible stories of getting impregnated by aliens, all these things. And you're like, going, you're scratching your head going, I don't know if I believe it, but I certainly find <laughs> I what see, they're saying very credible. I see because, your authenticity. Yeah, yeah. it was, and this a lot of them are middle aged now. They're older people. This started happening when they were younger, supposedly, and then now they're older and they're recounting these stories as though it happened yesterday. Mm. Not many people can do that and have still have the emotion involved with it. This is obviously traumatic for them, whatever it was. So I would say, you know, it's a good film. I wish it was shorter, but I think it was a good film in so far as showing a different aspect and angle on this because we've all seen a bunch yeah, of these UFO have. project things. What do you uh, think that Pastina Fest does? Like tonight's a mixer, right? All the filmmakers are out. There's an open bar. Mm -hmm. There, you know, there's food put out, and everyone gets to mix and yep. mingle. Do you uh, think that? Uh, do you find that cool? And what other extra things does the fest add that that you like? Well, the open bar surely brings it a <laughs> Vinny Vidi Vici. Uh, uh, what is it? Uh, um, what, what's the the uh, the the Latin for in wine there is truth, in vino veritas. Oh, and sometimes some of these guys get, get a little oh, snootful get, and let's send them over here. Yeah, when they, they get they're, they're, I want to talk, yeah, talk to these guys. <laughs> they're uh, there's a little bit more um, free and open debate. I think sometimes about stuff, and then sometimes there's just a bunch of wallflowers like me. I don't like to talk to very, very many people. I'm sitting here looking at my phone until I came to talk to you. But you know, some of these people are together. They have other projects. They've met at other film festivals. And they just get it back together and say hi. Others that are kind of like, they don't have their own little group and they don't have their own little film with their own little group. It's it's tougher, I think, to mingle when you're a single. Mm. A single mingle is not good. Gotcha. But when you're in a group, you can kind of approach another group and they talk about each other's films. I think it's very good in so far as getting filmmakers to talk to each other. Now, no, you're probably not going to meet, meet some producer that's going to go produce your script or going to you know give you money to take your short and make it into a long film. But the idea, I think, is more of the community of like-minded people all doing low budget to no budget sometimes films trying to do trying to follow their dream of filmmaking and or script writing and or whatever they're doing in their own way and at their own pace with whatever means they have available and in that regard you can't buy the kind of camaraderie you can a couple of people i met here last year have been great friends for the last year mm -hmm. since last year the festival and i you know we can, you can ask for yeah and these are guys that did a short and they they were going to do a toast, but they were missing one guy because the one guy didn't make it to the festival. So they looked at me, and I'm sitting here alone with my little bottle of Hint water because I don't drink, and they do like this to me, and they call me over there. So all of a sudden, I became part of the Papua people. Now, Papua is the name of the short film. It's a very good little short film, funny as heck, uh, directed by a guy named uh, Johnny, um, Johnny Deus. Jo Johnny, Johnny something Deus. I keep forgetting his middle name, but it's Johnny Deus. He's, a, he's an IMBD. The thing I didn't know about Johnny Diaz when I met him there with toasting with the other guys from the Papua <laughs> Short last year was that Johnny, I was at the Muskogee Film Festival earlier that year, and I'd seen a harsh, harsh film about uh, human trafficking. Mm. And this very Mexican with tattoos and a bald head um, that played a villain, he played a pimp, basically. He was beautifully ruthless, and he gave 
the character just enough depth to where you hated him even more because you knew he was a human being still making these choices. He wasn't pure evil. He was just a dick. So you have that feeling of, <laughs> I, I love hating this guy because he actually has some depth. And this was Johnny Ray Diaz. Johnny Ray Diaz. Oh, okay. And I, I finally connected the name. And I went, Johnny, did you do this, this movie? Uh, I forget the name of it now. And he said, yeah. And I went, you were fantastic. In that movie. I never would have thought, now you have hair. You don't have any tattoos. You're not wearing a wife beater. And you don't have an accent because he had the, the very Mexican accent in the movie. Uh, it was a complete, Smaller. you know, a, little, a complete uh, Daniel Day Lewis submersion. Yeah. And I thought, what a heck of an actor. So if, if ever you guys ever look at Johnny Ray Diaz, IMBDM, the guy, uh, you know, I think he was just on an episode of one of those crime dramas. I forget which one. The, the, these are the people you're going to meet at a fest like this. Yeah. And then uh, you make your connections. Well, and now, uh, Well, he's an actor and a director. He's directed short films of Papua. And he's, uh, you know, acted in everything from episodic TV to, to movies like that when I was talking the human traffic human trafficking movie, I wish I could remember the title because it was it won awards here and there. I saw it first at World Fest Houston that I, well, I was winning an award at World Fest Houston a couple of years ago, and then I went to Muskogee with another film that I was actually showing a little short, and then I walked in this thing and I was like, you know, it was so damningly depressing. But uh, just look up human trafficking film, you'll probably find <laughs> it. But uh, but no, the performance was amazing. All the performances in that film were amazing. And to be doing it on, again, an indie budget, yeah. which is usually, what, 250000 maybe 250000 which A couple of guys here made a feature for ten. Which uh, a little rom-com. You, you know, know is nothing. And I think that's why, well, like a friend of mine that I know now who's a producer, another film that met, won the top prize in Indiana somewhere, this guy's name is Steven Susco. Now, Steven uh, did something at Blumhouse. And he said, you can pitch to Blumhouse as long as you have a... Kind of a self-contained six-person horror movie that you can do if we're under a million dollars. Yeah, I heard, <laughs> and I, I hope that to God this is true. All Blumhouse wants is low budget, and he will not force a release date. And he gives directors final cut. I believe he'll he'll give his ideas, mm -hmm. and that that I mean it, clearly it's working wonders for him. And mm -hmm. more producers should and more studios should embrace the people they hire to make the films and, and their vision. And keep the budget low for the love of God. Look at M. Night Shyamalan, who was making these big budget movies that Flop. wouldn't make the money back. Now he's making movies for five, ten million. If they make thirty million, they're a hit. But he's they're making one hundred and ten, and he's a genius. I, I hear he budget he uh, uh, did uh, mortgage his house to do the, the latest one that he did with the the one that was a big hit with the three glass. Yeah, glass. Oh, wow. The last one because nobody wanted to finance it, or at least not all of it. Yeah. So he kind of self financed it and looked. I think it became I'm a pretty sure it'll pay pretty off. big yeah, hit. Absolutely. Um, but and the thing is, M. Night Shyamalan, because of his past triumphs, they don't care about what he did. Re they don't care about Lady in the Water. They care about the Sixth Sense. You know? right, right. They don't care about the happening. They they, they care about uh, having another signs. Having and, another hit will make people forget those even more, though. Yeah. So I'm but, glad he's on a, another role. Another role, yeah. And by but, doing it, by keeping the budget low. Yeah. Well, and the thing about Blumhouse, going back to them, is you almost can't lose on a budget of a million. I mean, if you keep the budget on a million or under, yeah. one. You give unknown writers a chance. You give first-time directors, like Steven Susco was a first-time director, although he'd been screenwriting for years. You give a lot of kind of semi-unknown actors that may be SAG, but nobody knows them, not household names, yet you're going to give them a little showcase where they're the stars of a low-budget movie or some that maybe haven't worked in a few years. Maybe they were Disney or Nick teen actors, and now they're 20-somethings. They can't get a job. Unfriended. No. You know, the unfriended? It cost like 30 grand. It made 30 million. Yeah. I mean... It, it, well, actually, he did Dark. Uh, Susco did Dark Web, the, sequ the sequel. Right, right, Unfriended. Unfriended. Okay. Okay. Yeah. But the deal is that instead of doing it as a sequel, because in Unfriended it was like a ghost in the machine yeah. sort of thing. But in the way they said, we're going to, the concept of having it all on the computer screen, that's going to be the sequel thing, the, the, the genre of that kind of movie. And um, he just did an old, his own little take on it. And it was very good and very involving. I'd never seen Unfriended. So I walked into this, a, a sneak he was doing of that here in. L.A. over at, um, oh, that theater across from the Cinerama Dome. Not really a theater, but it's a school. Oh, the a L.A. School. Film School, yeah. That's cool. Yeah, so we saw it there, and I was like, because I'd never seen the idea, and I thought, okay, this is going to replace found footage for a while as being the next, because then they did the, the latest your, one with the, the Asian guy. The John from, Cho film. Yeah. yeah uh, 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 searching. The, yeah, yeah, the uh, Harold and Kumar guy. So now it's a, it's a genre. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> yeah. Well, and the thing is, I don't know if it's going to peter out as quickly as well, actually, the found footage genre didn't peter out that quickly. Still quick. going. Yeah. Uh, they I mean, know it's cheap to do, so uh, they do it. I always get nauseous with it. I think I walked out in the middle of uh, Cloverfield because I was like, okay, that's it. I mean, just too much shaky cam. Let me ask you uh, last question. Favorite movie of all time? I ask this of everybody, and uh, that's the face they always make. 
<laughs> but it's a great question. It's hard to pick a favorite movie of all time unless I go genre by genre. I don't know. People but, often do. You can cheat. I don't hold any real uh, but, well, rules I, here. Well, I remember, you know, it's funny. I have to hearken back to my youth back in the day. I remember in 1977, I was an 18-year-old kid. I go to see Star Wars. And I, I'm, I'm there in line. I'm one of the first people to see Star Wars because in San Antonio, they were doing a little bit of a sneak. So we go over there and I'm going, what a great little movie. Too bad it's not going to make any money. <laughs> Stupid. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, and all my friends went, you know, I said, oh, it's, it's got no name actors. Who the hell in America knows Alec Guinness? Uh, it's, got, <laughs> it's got cute but relatively cheesy, even at those standards. It was only a $10 million movie in 1977, which it wasn't a bad budget, but wasn't a huge budget for sci-fi. So to me, I said, it isn't gonna ha- it's not going to happen. It's like 20 minutes of just robots and Jawas. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and I sat there thinking. Why would that be a hit? And Mark Hamill, I was like, okay. Uh, I mean, Harrison Ford is an unknown. Everybody was an unknown. Carrie Fisher was known as Debbie Reynolds' daughter. So I said, well, it may, it may make its money back. When I ask, of course, what your favorite movie of all time is, I, it's usually assumed, and I told this to the other guys, besides Star Wars. Oh. Because <laughs> everyone's favorite movie of all time is Star Wars. Well, and I, I, it's funny, because really, of the Star Wars genre, my favorite one of those was Empire Strikes Back. Yeah. Which most Star Wars aficionados will say, I love Star Wars, but boy, Empire Strikes Back was, you know. And then, of course, Return of the Jedi was kind of an anticlimax to a lot of people. Yeah, and then it's when it started to get goofy, and you well, can see it, the goofiness writing on the wall, you well, know, it, when it, the special editions and the prequels it, came around. But it kind of it wrapped up, shall we say, rather gingerly and rather quickly. It's like, whoa, here we go. We're, we're, it's time to end the movie now. It was like Paul Schrader, the director. Paul Schrader, the director, back in the day, would always do what they call a Paul Schrader ending. They'd be milling around this movie for an hour and a half. All of a sudden, all of a sudden he goes, it's time to end the movie now. And somebody dies and things blow up. <laughs> in, uh, like in something like um, the uh, movie um, that Tom Cruise was in with 9,000 other people. It was a P.T. Anderson movie. Oh, Magnolia? Where, yeah, where at the end, frogs. <laughs> yeah, right. I'm like, yeah. what the hell? But literally a plague. It God literally God. just hits time to stop. And the movie doesn't really end. It just kind of <laughs> stops. Yeah. And sometimes I felt the one thing I loved about getting back to Emily Shyamalan was like in movies like Sixth Sense, there was that massive twist that yeah. as a writer, you're going, I should have seen that coming all along. He never was really talking to anybody. He was actually talking back to him. It was, he, it was yeah, forecast yeah. and yet not. Oh, it was wh- so, so okay, brilliant. Why when the boy was going to see the dead girl's father, was he riding on the bus with him? Wouldn't he have driven him in his car? I mean, all these little <laughs> things, little hints. And, yes, you know, sir. didn't until you saw that woman with the, the mist coming out of her mouth, the frost guy, I'm going... Oh, my God. Yeah. And, and then the missed know, bill at the table and everything. And it's yeah. funny. A friend of mine is a big, well, he's actually has a degree now in film history. And he said, I knew it from the beginning. And I said, what do you mean? He goes, because this, this is the way movies work. You don't realize it, but this is the way movies work. When a major character gets injured mortally or badly, the follow-up scene is either at a hospital or at a funeral home. I mean, at the funeral, at the, you know, at the service. And that, and if you look at all the movies... All right. Think of a movie where the major star, major character in the beginning gets hurt or injured, where you don't see a follow-up scene at the hospital where either they're telling him he's dead or they're telling him he's going to recover or they go to his, his funeral or to his service. It cut right to him on the bench in a park and not at his office, not you know at the bench in the park. At the minute, my friend Larry Doschlager of Chicago <laughs> said, boom. I knew uh, that, something that funky sucks was going for him, on. though, to not enjoy all that. Well, yeah, because he couldn't enjoy it the way the rest of the humanity yeah. did. But uh, favorite movie is a toughie. I'll ask you then. What? What? How do you answer? What's your oh, favorite? Raiders movie? of the Lost Ark. Only because over time, that's how it. Uh, it, it. I mean, thirty-eight years with this movie, yeah. it has moved to the front of the pack in terms of all technical okay. aspects. We're working on all cylinders. But how do you how do you feel about that that latest sequel where? Shia LaBeouf was playing his kid and all that crap. None of the sequels are really all that good in comparison. I mean, right. they that Star Wars. I like Star Wars the best of the Star Wars movies too because those two Raiders and Star Wars were birthed from '70s cinema, you know. And then they be got then they got goofy. You can see all these. You can see all these. Uh, like every franchise just likes to get goofy. By the time you get Return of the Jedi, there's burps and farts and stuff. And by the time you get into Last Crusade, Indiana Jones is doing a Scottish character where he would just beat the crap out of people and get into place in the first movie. He's got to do a Scottish character. I'm here to see the tapestry. I mean, that's not that's not what they do in Indiana Jones. The, the okay. Crystal Skull is beyond uh, its reprehensible. Oh, I, I really like John Hurt in that one. Uh, uh, that's the only Jar Jar like. Hurt, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Anyway, no, what, what to me is interesting is 
I love the Mad, Mar Mad Magazine parody of Raiders of the Lost Ark. They called it Raiders of a Lost Art. And basically they were saying, basically in parody, it kind of took the serial idea it did. and just jammed it together. Because yeah. every 10 minutes or so, somebody was in peril and got out of it. But I think proudly, I think yeah. they, you know, they weren't afraid. But you, you, you've dodged the question, sir. What, what is your favorite movie? Oh, yeah. Okay, Give me a couple. Okay, emotionally. Emotionally, it's got to be E.T. Yeah. Because E.T., I mean, the story, ostensibly, it's about this alien creature and its bond with this little boy. But it basically is about bonding of love between even thing, even two different species. Because basically, when people, people enjoy it, even that don't enjoy science fiction, enjoy E.T. Because it's about basically a boy and his dog story mm -hmm. about a boy and his alien. Mm -hmm. And it, it touched that human emotional bond. And also... I don't know how you bought those performances. You know, no, none of those kid actors, even Drew Barrymore was an unknown at the time. All of them were absolutely perfect, and it's hard to not get involved with, you yeah. know, Henry Thomas crying and Drew Barrymore screaming and just E.T. with Deborah Winger's voice, you know, with his, his neck going up. If you, you haven't know, watched the Henry Thomas's audition interview, it's, it's online, yeah, and he's hired on the spot, <clears> right? I mean, that's amazing. No, I mean, I hear you see people going, hey, I got the role, kid. Yeah. And there it goes. But no, uh, so emotionally be that one. I don't know. I think uh, there were a couple of movies that came out the same year, 1984. And these were two movies that really were fascinating to me. I loved one of them because it talked about fantasy and the importance of fantasy. It was called A Never-Ending Story based on the book. Um, um, Werner, uh, the famous German director, I'm blanking on his name. Wolfgang Peterson. Wolfgang Peterson did that movie. Unknown to American audiences until that movie. Did little miniatures, you know, such cheesy stuff. It didn't matter. It was about the idea that the importance of fantasy. Yeah. And now that the kids are always doing this, I get the feeling that they're not having enough time to pretend to be bored enough to pretend and and make up their own stories and play and do yeah. do things with their imagination because they don't have to imagine. They can have it right here. Yeah. And that to me is a failing of the, of future writers and future creators because what's going to happen to a bunch of kids that are used to being spoon fed images spoon-fed uh, stories and not be able to make up any of their own. Well said. I yeah. mean, let's face it. When push comes to shove, uh, the best reader in the world isn't the best writer in the world, but they got a shot at it. And I've always said, you know, we, we grew up in a world where we could imagine the iPhone. Now they just have one. So yeah. there's no, it's kind of like the there's no wonder. The, the, the tricorder. You can analyze it. No, wonder no matter it. what question you want to ask, you can have it in an instant. Yeah. And the other movie that came out in 84, which is the importance of growing up and putting aside childish things, was Cloak and Dagger, another Henry Thomas movie, yeah. which he made in San Antonio. Because Dabney they, Coleman? Yeah. yeah. Dabney Coleman playing a good guy for once. Yeah, yeah. I loved him because he was always playing a jerk. He was a jerk. And here he played... Such this, a good jerk. Yeah. No, he was fantastic. <laughs> oh, come on, <laughs> yeah. nine to five? Tootsie, yeah. Oh, my, one of my favorites, sub, subsequent jerk, or um, a sub-jerk to uh, Steve Forrest, I believe his character, uh, North Dallas 40. Yeah. He played a jerk in North Dallas 40. He was excellent. But... Finally, in Cloak and Dagger, we got to see him play an everyman, and he was freaking brilliant. I wish they'd made, let him do it more. They never did. But, but then he had to make some money. But the thing is, that movie was about growing up and, and putting aside a little bit of the fantasy and not living so much in a dream world. I thought these two should be presented as a double feature because they both came out within a couple of months of each other. And although Cloak and Dagger was a bomb and a Never Any Story was a success, I just think they both offset each other so much insofar as what childhood can mean to you. And if childhood means to you the idea of fantasizing and using your imagination, that's a very valid point. But once you get to a certain age, 12, 13 or so, you start thinking that old thing about uh, when I was a child, I spake as a child, understood as a child. When I became a man, I put aside childish things and, you know, got on your life. I think it's important to know that there's that distinction, but there's room for both. And both movies, even though there were very salient points and differing points, I enjoyed the heck out of both of them because of those points. Because both of those things are intrinsically important. And I think we're hearing too much background noise. <laughs> no, no, these mics are, uh, we'll rise above the din, but we'll wrap uh, it up. Yes, sir. Uh, Ed, thanks. Uh, I, uh, thank I hope you. you enjoy the rest of the fest. You got, yeah. uh, is there something you're looking forward to? Uh, uh, actually, I'm coming back for sure on Tuesday, and there are a bunch of little shorts. I love the shorts. Yeah. To me, the shorts are like the weather in Texas. Wait 10 minutes, you'll, you'll change, you'll see another <laughs> short. And yeah. if you don't like one thing, something else will be coming around the corner yeah. in 10 or 15 minutes. And also, as a guy who started out in playwriting, who used to write 10 minute plays starting out, boy, when you've written, when you've written, when you've written, when you've written, when you've written <laughs> 10 minute plays, um, when you do a one act, when you do a full length, you have this expanse of consciousness. It is so much harder to condense your idea into 10 pages, yep. 10 minutes on stage. It is so much harder for you to condense a story idea for a film 
into a lot of visuals, some dialogue, and 10, 15, 20 pages, so you can have a 10 to 15, 20 minute movie. That's incredibly difficult. Now, it's a little bit easier in a movie because you can show in one visual something that would take you a long time on stage to get across in dialogue and character. But, although it's doable, I think it's an art form in and of itself. And the thing that kills me is every year at the Oscars, the, the, if they, whoever votes on the shorts, I hope they saw them. I hope they actually sat down and saw Because some of them just go, I like that title, boom. Because yeah. when the majority, when the whole Academy votes on the shorts, half of them, I don't think I've seen them all. But the, but the awards this year, the people who won the best uh, it, the best live action short film mm -hmm. won best live action short film and also won the unofficial most enthusiastic award I don't know if you remember their speech but oh, it was amazing yeah. oh, like and you kind of see the real joy of filmmakers and the people who have the most passion for it yeah. still well, you know just being so well, excited well these are the ones that don't need a paycheck don't need the big house yeah. in Malibu they'll do it you know I live in a little bungalow in Burbank but I, I at least you know, make a make a rent check, but I want to be there to do what I love, and that's the main. The focus of life isn't about what you do as a vocation. The focus of life is what you should do as an avocation. What do you do when you're not at work, pounding out a buck? And that's when the true you really comes out. Whether it's doing a podcast, whether it's <laughs> uh, writing a novel or writing a script, or whether it's acting. All of these people with these dreams can exercise their dreams in so many different levels, in so many different ways. They don't have to make a million bucks. They don't have to be wildly financially successful. If you're successful in life, it's because you've done something you truly care about, you've done it many times over, and you love doing it as you were doing it. You know, my dad always said, when you look to something that you want to do, when you get up in the morning, do you say, oh, I got to do this, or oh, I get to do this. And if you can wake up in the morning and have something to look forward to that's a get to do, not a got to do, like your work -a day job, maybe mm -hmm. working at a dentist's office, then you've lived a good life. You've lived an exemplary life for other people. Whether you're Spielberg or whether you're Podunk Nobody that did a web series like me or did, oh, by the way, the web series is called Dad vs. Lad. <laughs> it's on YouTube. There's eight seasons of it, about 49 episodes. They're all about five to ten minutes long. Watch it. Anyway, so that, that in and of itself is something to look forward to, something to look to with pride and something to say, my life was not a failure. It was just a success that I feel is successful, not that the world might accept as being successful. Because all the world thinks about is, how did you do monetarily? Did nine million people know who you were? Or did maybe 900 enthusiastic people knew who you were? <laughs> so anyway, thank you so much. Tim's wise words to end on, Ed. Thanks so much. Enjoy the rest of the festival. I uh, thank you for this moment to sit here and flap my gums. And as you, Marco <laughs> warned you, I can talk. Yeah. We'll be back with a few more filmmakers. <laughs>